to start. It's a great pleasure to have Eckerd Myrinken from Toronto giving the first talk today, and he will talk about weighted Euler-like vector fields. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Great pleasure to be back again at this wonderful place and seeing so many good old friends. Um, so, as I've written down here, uh, this is uh, very much work in progress. So I'm, I'm not quite sure yet if I've found the optimal way of, of uh, presenting things, and I'm also still looking for uh, more interesting um, applications. So not, not only more interesting, but also more interesting. <laughs> um, but it's related to some uh, work we've, we've done in, in, in the past. So the, uh, the idea of Euler-like vector fields was introduced in this paper of Enrique and Hudson and myself in 2016, I believe. Um, then there was a paper by uh, Hart and Hickson, uh, which improved on our proof a little bit and also gave some further generalizations and applications. And then we uh, improved on their proof a little bit and give some further applications and generalizations. And Hicks and Yi ag again uh, return to the same kind of idea. Um, but yeah, so this, this uh, idea of, of, of doing some weightings, oh, I'm uh, there. Uh, idea of, of doing some, some weightings uh, is, is something that I still wanted to add to the story. And to explain things, uh, so to explain what it's all about, uh, it's maybe easiest to start out with the simplest case of Rn. So in Rn, uh, what I mean by Euler vector field is just what you think I mean. It's just the usual Euler vector field whose flow is just scalar multiplication. So I'm going to denote kappa t. It's just multiplying by t on each factor. So the flow of this vector field is uh, scalar multiplication by, well, exponential of s. Hmm? Right. And the theorem we have is, uh, OK, let x be a vector field on Rn. Uh, which vanishes at zero, and which is uh, the Euler vector field up to higher order perturbations. Uh, so one way of saying this is if I pull back under the scalar multiplication map, it's the Euler vector field plus higher order terms. Then the theorem is there exists A diffeomorphism. Uh, well, to be precise, I should say germ of a diffeomorphism. So f from now on, I'm, I'm typically going to uh, omit uh, talk about germs. So things are only happening locally. Well, such that uh, phi pullback x equals the Euler vector fields. So in a, in a way, it says that Euler vector fields can be linearized. You can make it change of coordinates. You can think of phi as a change of coordinates. And after that change of coordinates, any higher order terms that you may have in x, they just go away. That's the theorem. So this theorem follows actually from a general result about linearizations of, of vector fields, the classical result of, of, of Sternberg. But in, in this paper, we gave a very simple proof of this special case. And I don't want to repeat the proof again uh, because I've talked about this so many times, but in a nutshell, so as a sketch, uh, this uh, diffeomorphism is, is obtained as the time one flow of the vector field, uh, so a flow of a time-dependent vector field, which is 1 over t, kappa t pullback x minus e. So it's, it's very explicit. You introduce this vector field, you take the time on flow, and, and that diffeomorphism does the job. So this is the f proof in a nutshell. So one, one example of, of the situation is, for instance, uh, the vector field x equals x times d by dx plus y times d by dy. So this would be the Euler vector field in R2. 
And then you have some perturbation y squared d by dx. And so I'm saying you can make a change of coordinates so that this higher order term just disappears. Let me give one quick application. I can't quite help it because oh, it's so nice. Application to Moore's lemma. Uh, Moore's lemma in Rn says that uh, suppose we have a smooth function uh, with a critical point at some point x0. Uh, let's also assume we're just adding constant that vanishes there. Then you can f uh, find local coordinates in which f is quadratic. Uh, sorry, non-degenerate, of course. Non-degenerate, I have to. Very important. So the Hessian has to be uh, non, 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 it has to be invertible. Uh, so then there exists uh, local coordinates such that f is quadratic. Putting that into further normal form, that's, that's the easy part. But once you have these local coordinates, then, then you're in business. And the proof using Euler-like vector fields goes as follows. You first choose any coordinates. So using any coordinates, you write using Taylor expansion, uh, f as sum aij of x, xi, xj. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is just by Taylor. Uh, yeah, Taylor. Uh, it's t Taylor expansion with remainder, so this is the second order remainder term. Uh, the derivatives are then given by a similar expression. Uh, well, you just take the derivative of the right-hand side, of course, and you get it like this. Well, you can easily work out the explicit formula for this B. It doesn't even matter. Uh, all we need is that A at 0 is same as B of 0. Hmm? Kind of immediate. And uh, non-degeneracy means that, uh, as a matrix, this is invertible. And now you introduce the vector field x, which is uh, summation a times b inverse ij uh, xi d by dxj. I hope I got this right with the coefficients. So the observation is because a and b are the same at the identity, uh, at the identity this would be the identity matrix. So this is the Euler vector field up to higher order terms. It's, it's Euler-like. And so, so you get this diffeomorphism phi from, from the theorem. And the way I've set things up is if you take the Lie derivative of the function f with respect to this vector field, I guess you can kind of see it. Then you get the f by dxj, which I've with this formula, the b's cancel. You get that up to a factor of two. So this is twice f. Now you pull this identity back under diffeomorphism phi. Then, so phi pullback of x is the Euler vector field. So you get Lie derivative of E of phi pullback f equals twice phi pullback f. But this identity tells you that phi pullback f is homogeneous of degree two. It's quadratic. So it's QED. We're already done. So that's super easy proof of Moore's lemma. And Dabu's theorem you can do in the same way. So in, in a way, one doesn't need uh, Moser type arguments anymore because the Moser type argument was already used here. Okay, now, now I want to generalize things a little bit uh, to this weighted context. So now I, I want to do the weighted context. So the way I'm, I'm going to change things is uh, I'm going to introduce some weights. 
actual numbers. And yeah, I'm going to stick in the weights in the Euler vector field. Like this. So now the flow would be with corresponding weights. And yeah, the observation is, um, so th this is something I, I noticed in the early days of, of our paper and, and never could quite put it into some, some geometric framework, is that the same theorem actually works. So exactly the same statement is true with exactly the same proof. No, so, so theorem with this modification still still okay. So an, an example, again, is this vector field. But uh, no, sorry, th th this vector field, uh, of course, is an example, but uh, I want to have some weighted examples. So to put, put a factor of two here, for instance. Hmm? So if there's a factor of two here, it's, it still works. So you get a diffeomorphism in such a way that this term disappears. So the, the way we have to think here is uh, the coordinate x has weight one, coordinate y has weight two. And so this expression here has weight four minus one is three, so it's higher order. And so we can make this change of coordinates so it disappears. But it's not quite uh, like a linearization theorem in, in the usual sense, because for instance, I could do this and it's still fine, because this has degree two, this has degree one. I, I say I can make a change of coordinates so that this term disappears. So from, from, from the viewpoint of, of uh, linearization of vector fields, this is a resonant case, so it's not entirely obvious how, 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 how this case works out. So, so this, this is still okay. Um, but if you take, for instance, uh, x squared d, d by dy, uh, that is not okay. Because this has degree two, this has degree two, so the whole thing has degree zero. It's not of higher order. And indeed, this is one example of a uh, um, vector field with a critical point at zero that is not linearizable. It's, it's not possible to make this term to go away. This is kind of the, the standard example, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the, the, this, this term is, is not good. Okay, so, so yeah, as I said, this, this I observed many years ago, but, but then the question is how to uh, put this into some differential geometric uh, context. Now, first of all, I, I should explain how, how to even put the old um, Euler-like vector field story into a differential geometric context. Let's maybe in the center a little bit. So again, I'm, I'm going to go back to the story that I've explained and talked about many times. Uh, so, so now, now we're going to uh, deal with manifolds. Uh, So, sorry, what? X delta y. Uh, X delta y is also not good. No, b b because it's, uh, we, we can only throw away what is of higher order. X delta y would have degree minus one. So it, it has to have degree uh, one or higher. Hmm? Th then, then we can get rid of it. Hmm? Okay, so now I'm we're going to deal with manifolds and submanifolds. And I denote by nu of mn uh, the normal bundle, so usual normal bundle. Um, one thing I, I should recall is, is if you have a vector bundle, then uh, the normal bundle relative to the zero section is just E itself. I mean, it's canonically isomorphic. So that's why we put an equality. It's not, not just isomorphic, it's canonically isomorphic. Uh, and using this, we, we can uh, give a clean definition of tubular neighborhood embedding. So my definition of tubular neighborhood embedding is a tubular 
neighborhood embedding is a map, a smooth map, uh, which takes the normal bundle into M uh, in such a way that it takes the zero section to N. Uh, so the zero section of the normal bundle gets mapped to N. So I want to think of this as a map of pairs. Uh, such that, uh, okay, the, its linear approximation is the identity. Okay, I have to explain this a little bit. So the point for me is uh, normal bundle is, is really a functor. So it's a, it's a functor on, on pairs of manifolds. To, for every pair of manifold, you get a vector bundle and given <coughs> a map between pairs of manifolds, you get a vector bundle map. So here we have a map between pairs of, of manifolds, so I can pl apply the normal bundle functor to it. And here we have the setting, a vector bundle relative to zero section, so the normal bundle functor applied to this is just the normal bundle itself. And then it maps to the normal bundle functor applied to that, it's also the normal bundle itself. And, so, and that map should be the identity. In plain language, what this means is, um, that this map should be along n, it should be the identity map, and then also in first order approximation in normal directions should also be the identity. Th that's tubular neighborhood embedding. Uh, second thing I need is, um, so if you have a vector field, so again as an application of functor reality, uh, if x is a vector field on m which is tangent to n, then I can uh, speak about its linear approximation. Uh, which I sometimes denote by x0 and sometimes by nu of x. Nu of x indicates that this is really, again, an application of the normal bundle functor. Um, namely, um, so x being tangent to n means it's a map from m to the tangent bundle, so as a section, which takes n to tangent bundle of n. So if you apply the normal bundle functor to that, it's a map from here to there, which is the tangent bundle of the normal bundle. And so it becomes a section of the tangent bundle of the normal bundle, so it can be thought of as a vector field on the normal bundle. This is a vector field on the normal bundle. It's a linear approximation. And the definition of Euler-like vector field is so X is Euler-like. Uh, with respect to the submanifold n, I should say, uh, if uh, this linear approximation is just the Euler vector field on the normal bundle. Yeah, the, 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 vector field, the Euler vector field on any vector bundle is uh, the vector field whose flow is scalar multiplication in the fibers. Hmm? Okay, on our th theorem, So from this uh, BLM paper, was that Euler-like vector fields and tubular neighborhood embeddings are basically the same thing, namely that for every Euler-like vector field, if X is Euler-like, there exists, in fact, a unique uh, tubular neighborhood embedding phi. such that under this embedding, X becomes the Euler vector field. Sorry, again, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit here. I'm always talking about germs. Yeah, question? So here you don't need any 
uh, no, because I'm just just talking about you know, compactness on, on, and you can do things locally and mm. maybe maybe I want n to be closed up in the fold, but no, not 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 nothing with compactness. No, no, uh, we, we can make, uh, so in the paper we make things very precise. For example, if, if, if the vector field is complete, then you get an embedding of the entire normal bundle globally. If it's not complete, then you can say exactly uh, like on which set it's defined and, and what the image is. So it's, it's very, very precise. So everything is under control. Yeah, cl 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 uh, closed embedded submanifold, yeah. All right. Again, I want to do one application. Uh, any other questions? Let's do one application. Basically, a similar kind of idea, but now for manifolds. I mean, I could do, uh, for example, Morse bot, but let, let's do a somewhat different kind of example with more symplectic geometry. I'm, I'm going to do application to uh, Weinstein's theorem. Well, of course, Weinstein has done many theorems, uh, but uh, I mean the theorem about Lagrangian embeddings. So, I'm going to assume I have a symplectic manifold. And N is Lagrangian. Right. So, Lagrangian means that it has half the dimension and uh, the pullback of the symplectic form is zero. Now, if the pullback of a symplectic form is zero, well, it's actually true for, for any differential form. If the pullback of a differential form to a submanifold is zero, then you get a linear approximation. So, get linear approximation. which is to form on the normal bundle. And yeah, it's not hard to see this linear approximation is symplectic. I mean, you, it's easy to see it has to be symplectic along the submanifold and then just be because it's linear it has to be symplectic everywhere. Hmm? Okay, and the theorem uh, says that there exists a tubular neighbor embedding such that our symplectic form pulls back to this model form. Hmm? And I want to explain how to prove this using Euler-like vector fields, well, just as a sketch at least. First step is that one uh, chooses a primitive of omega on some neighborhood of n. So choose a one form. So again, I should always say germs along n. I'm going to omit this detail. Uh, so I choose a one form along m. I, I want to choose in such a way actually that its restriction to n as a section is, is zero. Uh, such that d of alpha is equal to omega n near n. Yeah, so typically, uh, one would use some uh, initial tubular neighborhood embedding and then just use the usual Dram homotopy operator, and, th and then you get a, a primitive with this property. Okay, and, and then you define. Uh, a vector field X in terms of this uh, one form. So contraction of omega with this X is alpha. Okay, so the, the, the point about this is this X automatically is Euler-like. Um, how to see this? Well, um, I can see that these two properties linearize. Right, so 
we have alpha zero vanishes along n, so it has a linearization, and this implies that linearization vanishes along n, and d of alpha zero is omega zero, right? But um, if one thinks about it a little bit, um, because everything is linear, there's actually a unique one form which has this property. If you have a, a vector bundle with a linear symplectic form, there's a unique primitive for this property. It's given by contraction of omega zero with the Euler vector field. So this implies alpha zero is contraction of omega zero with the Euler vector field. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this property, if you linearize it, also tells you that contraction with uh, omega zero of omega zero with x zero is alpha zero. And since omega zero is non-degenerate, you take these two equations together, so it means x zero is the Euler vector field, and so x is Euler-like. Its linear approximation is the Euler vector field. Hmm? So it's Euler-like. And so I get my diffeomorphism phi, as in, in this uh, theorem. And I claim, and now we're basically done, because uh, if I take uh, the differential of this identity, I get Lx omega is d of alpha, which is omega. I pull this back under phi. And what this tells you is phi pullback of omega is linear. So it has to be equal to its linear approximation. And that's the end of proof. So you see, it's, it's basically the same idea like we had for this Morse lemma proof. You just need to find the right Euler, like vector field, and, and then you're good. There are various other things you can do with this uh, theorem. So in, in our uh, original papers, we, we mostly uh, use this to prove uh, various kind of splitting theorems. Weinstein splitting theorem, splitting theorem for Lie algebraids, and splitting theorem for all kinds of structures. One can also use it, as I mentioned, to prove, uh, you know, for example, um, morse bot uh, theorem, or morse bot lemma, uh, or um, uh, what else? Um, normal forms for clean intersections of submanifolds one can do. One can also prove um, linearization of proper Lie group points using the same technique. It's not actually a, a, a really different proof of, of, the, of the existing proof of, uh, of, of, of Marius and, and his co-author, but, um, but it kind of streamlines things, so to speak. Okay, but yeah, going back to this uh, application, um, one question you can ask is, uh, what about isotropic? So what is what said about the uh, isotropic submanifolds? Because you still have that the pullback of omega is zero, and you have the linear approximation. So why was it important here that, that our submanifold was Lagrangian? Well, the problem is, if, if you just have isotropic, then you can still form the linear approximation, but it's no longer symplectic. And it's easy to understand if you look at the standard normal form theorems for uh, isotropic submanifolds, because there are some directions in which uh, the symplectic form in normal directions is linear, and then there are some other directions where it's more like quadratic. And if you take the linear approximation, then you sort of throw away the quadratic part, and of, of course, it's no longer symplectic. So that's the problem. So to fix that problem, um, basically, uh, okay, so the problem is omega zero is not symplectic. And the idea is, of course, then to introduce weights. so that the linear directions, so to speak, count double. Right, 
So that, that's, that's one ma motivation why I was interested in, in, in developing a weighted analog of, of the whole Euler-like story. And, and there's some, some other motivations. Uh, for example, the so-called Lee manifolds. And, and this is something that was actually cited in this paper of Hatch and Hickson that I mentioned earlier. Lee manifolds are manifolds with a filtration of the tangent bundle so that the induced filtration on, on, on vector fields uh, is filtered Lie algebra. So they studied this, this context. And there seems to be some interesting differential geometry going on. Another uh, interesting context is um, Getzler rescaling from the famous Getzler proof of, of the index theorem. So this was uh, studied in a similar context by Hickson and, and, and Yi. And so I again, they came up with some um, kind of non-standard version of, of Euler-like vector fields and so on. And I, I kind of want to put everything together and, and unify it. But as I said, uh, it's work in progress. I haven't quite succeeded yet. So a little bit I can do but it's not quite finished. All right, so, so what's, what's interesting, um, um, what, what comes up, and, and this was already uh, seen in the paper of, of Hutch and Hickson, is, is that the normal bundles one is considering uh, are actually uh, not quite the standard normal bundles. Uh, they're, they're not even vector bundles. So in, in, in their context, there were certain homogeneous spaces. Mm. I believe what, what goes on in general is that there are examples of, of graded bundles. And I want to give a very quick review about graded bundles. Uh, so I'm going to follow mostly uh, Grabowski Rodkiewicz. It was also studied, for example, in this recent thesis of, of Miguel. Okay, so the definition is um, so their definition that a graded bundle is a manifold. with an action of R. But m not as a group, it's, it's like monoid. So it's a multiplicative group R. Hmm? Similar to what we had encountered before. So there's basically some, some kind of scalar multiplication operation. And, and that's, that's it. So vector bundles are a special case of this, um, but there are other examples. So m maybe first example is graded vector bundle. If you have a graded vector bundle, so with, with, with grading given by uh, natural numbers, and you take uh, the scalar multiplication uh, to be a multiplication by t to the i on the i summoned. Th that's obviously a, a graded bundle. But not all graded bundles arise as vector bundles. The other main example is uh, the Earth tangent bundle, TRM. So this is uh, the jet bundle, bundle of R jets of curves. Right. So you take, if you take a curve and take its first order tail approximation, that's that gives the tangent bundle. And if you ha take higher order jets, 
That's the auth tangent bundle. It's not, not quite the same as the iterated tangent bundle. It's of lower dimension. So this uh, has a scalar multiplication operation just by from coming from reparameterization of R. But the thing is this, is, this is not a vector bundle, at least not naturally. Hmm? So this is not a vector bundle. There's uh, a similar thing with uh, the Arth cotangent bundle. That ends up being a vector bundle, but the te Arth tangent bundle is not a vector bundle. Mm -hmm. Right, so some, some main properties of these graded manifolds. Or graded bundles. I mean, first of all, they're called graded bundles because they're actually bundles. So there, there are graded bundles. So E is a fiber bundle over the image of kappa zero. Right, so in this way you get the base of this fiber bundle and yeah, so they, they prove that it really is a fiber bundle. The, the definition doesn't require anything extra. Secondly, uh, well, I emphasize that E is not usually a vector bundle, but there's some graded vector bundle associated to it. Namely, uh, if you simply take uh, the normal bundle relative to its zero section, now this is a vector bundle. And the scalar multiplication, that you, the original scalar multiplication that you ha have on E, it commutes with the scalar multiplication for the vector bundle structure. So this is then a graded vector bundle. Right, so, so basically you, you back to this kind of example after all. So th there's a corresponding, in particular you have, the, you have the ranks of all these components and you have, have the, the R appearing. So I'm, I'm gonna call R the order. Of E, so because in, in the case of the R's tangent bundle, this is the same R. Third big fact is, according to Grabowski uh, Rodkiewicz, actually E is isomorphic to this uh, graded vector bundle. So isomorphism, of course, uh, uh, intertwining the, the scalar multiplication operations. Yeah, so it, it is, after all, a graded vector bundle, just not canonically. In, in this case, for example, uh, the graded vector bundle would just be R copies of, uh, the, the direct sum of R copies of TM with itself. But it's not canonically isomorphic to that. Uh, what else do I want to see? Oh yeah, uh, so every um, graded bundle comes with a tower. So for TRM, it's clear that, that you have maps to uh, the R minus first tangent bundle, and so on. And so this is true for any uh, graded bundle. E comes with a tower. <sighs> Where this is a graded bundle of order R minus one, R minus two, and so on. Uh, so how does this quotient map go? So. Uh, e.g. this map, this quotient map for, you say that x is equivalent to x prime, if and only if, uh, well you look at the corresponding curves that you get by scalar multiplication, so these are both curves, in E and they should have the same r minus one jet. way of saying this. Right, so th this is my, my crash course on, on, on graded bundles. Any questions about that? Yeah? 
Ah, uh, good, good question. Yeah, so, so it, it should be possible to, to prove, prove the summer using the, the unweighted theorem, but uh, yeah, I haven't looked into this yet. It's, it's proved in their paper, of course, but uh, there, there should be another proof using the original theorem in BLM, I believe. So, 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 so what it would boil down to is to, to prove something like this using uh, our technique, you would have to come up with an ordinary Euler vector field that commutes, uh, uh, that is invariant under this action. So once you have that, you're done. That's, that's right, yeah. Oh, yeah, so, so maybe, yeah, I, I think I know what you mean. Uh, so so there the exists a canonical map from E into TRE, uh, which is basically given by these jets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I believe that should be also proved like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, any, any other questions? Okay, th then I want to get to my notion of, of, of weightings for submanifolds. So no, now I'm getting to the part where, where, again, I'm not quite sure if, if, if I found the quite optimal way of explaining things. I mean, actually, I'm, I'm kind of sure that I haven't. So one context that definitely works uh, is uh, that you have a sequence of submanifolds, uh, a nested sequence. So consider some nested sequence of submanifolds like this. So a bit motivated by, by uh, th these Lee manifolds where you have a a filtration of, of the tangent bundle. Instead, I want to have this sequence of submanifolds. Okay, so, so the, the sequence of submanifolds uh, will determine what I call a weighting, but actually, we, we don't exactly need the, the submanifolds. So it turns out, uh, for example, um, of N1, I only need really the tangent bundle of N1 restricted to N0. Of N2, I only need the second tangent bundle of N2 restricted to the tangent bundle of N1, and so on. So, for this reason, this is not quite what I'm going to call a weighting. So I'm, I'm going to introduce a manifold Q. So uh, this is contained in the Rth tangent bundle of M. Um, and what it is, it's a set of uh, R jets of curves such that uh, for all I less or equal than R, uh, the ith jet is contained in the ith tangent bundle of Ni. This is the definition I'm, I'm going to use. So it's, 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 curve, it's a curve that is uh, tangent to N1, and then it's two tangent to N2, three tangent to N3, and so on. So. This Q, uh, I'm, I'm going to call a weighting. And so definition. Uh, so su sub bundles Q. I should say graded sub bundles uh, of this form are called weightings. So you could say it's, it's like uh, an equivalence class of, of, of sequences, of nested sequence of submanifolds like that. So again, this is probably not quite the optimal way of presenting things. I'm, I'm still looking for, for better ways of, of doing this. The case that one maybe wants to study first, the, the case R equals two, that's the first non-trivial non, uh, non case. 
So if, if r equals 2, then, then uh, the only new information that you have here is the submanifold n1. And as I said, we only care about this tangent bundle. So uh, the weighting is determined. determined by some sub-bundle of the tangent bundle, uh, which contains Tn. Or uh, it's equivalent to saying, let's call this instead F tilde. It's determined by some sub-bundle of the normal bundle. So in order two weighting, is simply a sub-bundle of the normal bundle. But higher order weightings are a bit harder to describe. OK, um, I didn't quite say this. Um, so so, so this, this Q is really a graded sub-bundle. Hmm? So th this is a, a, a graded sub-bundle automatically. And so it comes with a tower. So you have this tower that you always have. The description of this tower is actually kind of clear from the, from the de definition of this Q. Right, you just take the same definition, but then up to some lower index. This tower you can extend also in the other direction. So because uh, this is contained in TRM, one M, uh, so you can extend it further in the other direction as well, just by taking pre-images. Mm -hmm. And using this, I get a filtration of the algebra of functions. So I'm, I'm getting to, to, towards the definition of our weighted normal bundle. It's, it's going to involve a filtration of the algebra of functions. So this is a zero, a decreasing filtration. where, okay, the definition is like this. So a sub i is the set of functions such that if I take its i minus first jet, it vanishes on q i minus one. Okay, so this of course looks a little bit abstract how we, how we get this, but uh, so I'm, I'm claiming this is really a filtration of the algebra. It's compatible with the product structure. And yeah, m maybe to, to understand this uh, note, uh, what is A1? A1 just means F has to vanish on N. So this is just the usual vanishing ideal. And A2, uh, well, what we can say is, because the multiplicative it certainly con con uh, contains I squared, uh, but it could be a little bit bigger. And so on. So th this introduced the idea that uh, well, you should think of these AIs as vanishing to order i along n, but functions have uh, weights associated to, to them. And here we could have some functions that have weight 2, so they belong to A2. Hmm? So that's, that's basically the idea. If, if r is equal to 1, in the case r, r equals 1, uh, so you don't have any interesting Q, then uh, the filtration you get is simply uh, the usual order of vanishing. So here it's just a little more complicated. And yes, using this, I can give the definition of weighted normal bundles. A little abstract, but at 
least it's short. So definition, weighted normal bundle. So I'm, I'm gonna use a subscript, subscript W so we don't get confused with the usual normal bundle. Um, it's, you take uh, the associated graded algebra of this A, and then you take uh, algebra homomorphisms from this into R. So in some more plain language, uh, the associated graded algebra is a commutative graded algebra, and that's the algebra of polynomials on our graded manifold. No, so it's, it's basically like a spec definition. So this is the weird object that we have to work with. So, uh, so the fact is that this is a graded, manif graded bundle of order R. And yeah, so even in the case of R equals two, um, I'm, to be honest, a little bit confused still because all uh, we're given is some subbundle of the normal bundle. And what I'm claiming is that if you're giving a subbundle of the normal bundle, uh, you get canonically this weighted normal bundle of order R equals two. And I don't really know if a simple description of, of, of this weighted normal bundle other than this, this kind of um, algebraic geometry uh, description. Uh, I, I can't say that this weighted normal bundle can uh, be realized as a quotient of this manifold Q that I introduced. But I don't really have a very good way of describing the equivalence relation uh, that, that would make it kind of very easy. So this is a bit of a mystery to me. There should be some simpler description of this. Right, but, but in any case, so, so we now have this notion of uh, weighted normal bundle, and, and now we can basically repeat the story with the weighted, with, with the Euler-like vector fields. Uh, any questions at this point? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I mean, it's of course a very short description, but uh, you, you feel like in a setting like this, it should be much more elementary. You don't have to do anything of, 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 of this algebra nonsense. But yeah, that, that, that's what it is at the moment. Yeah, I should maybe emphasize again that uh, if R is equal to one, then uh, this filtration is just the filtration by order of vanishing. Uh, the associated graded algebra is, is then just the algebra of polynomials on the, on the normal bundle, and so this is then the usual normal bundle again. Okay, Euler like vector fields is also defined in terms of, of this filtration. So a vector field is weighted Euler like. if it has the property that for any uh, function of filtration degree k, uh, so our kind of new version of vanishing to order k along n, uh, you have that the Lie derivative is k times f plus higher order terms, so uh, a mod a k plus one. And so just like this would be the property of the usual uh, Euler vector field. I mean, Euler vector field would, would uh, the usual Euler vector field would have this property on functions that are homogeneous of degree k, and Euler-like means that you have some error terms. 
Right, and, and then we, we have the theorem that if x is weighted Euler-like, um, you get some kind of tubal enabled embedding of this fancy normal bundle. such that uh, the pullback of X is, uh, okay, it's, maybe I should put a subscript W, is the Euler vector field for, for my fancy scalar multiplication, right? Here we have this scalar multiplication operation, there's a corresponding Euler vector field, not quite the usual one. Mm -hmm. With basically the same techniques or proofs that we had in, in, in the other papers. Okay, to conclude, I just want to get back very briefly uh, to this uh, question that I asked about isotropic submanifolds. So isotropic submanifolds is the case R equals 2. case R equals 2, so it should just correspond to subbundle of the normal bundle. Of course, we know what it is. Uh, if you take Tn and then take its omega perp, that's a subbundle which contains Tn. And so this is the subbundle of the normal bundle in this case. All right, so this is our F. So uh, this determines one of these fancy graded bundles. Uh, so we get a weighted normal bundle. Order R equals two. And the way this story now plays out is quite interesting in my opinion. That, uh, so with, with our new um, uh, scalar multiplication operations, uh, this omega actually uh, vanishes to order two. And so omega gives rise to some um, kind of, you know, now it should be called quadratic approximation, really. So th there's uh, a canonically defined two form on this weighted normal bundle. And by the same argument as one had before, it's also symplectic. And, well, the, the version of, of isotropic embedding theorem in this context would be uh, that there exists uh, a tubular neighborhood embedding of this weighted normal bundle into M, uh, such that phi pullback omega is omega zero. So it's pretty much like the usual isotropic embedding theorems, but the, the nice part here is that my model space is actually completely canonical. The, the usual uh, isotropic embedding theorems, you have to choose some, some connections and so on, and, and it's, it's not quite canonical. Th this space I've constructed with this two forms is, is completely canonical. And yeah, I still want to understand this a little better. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, th this omega zero is globally symplectic by the same kind of argument because it's, it's symplectic along uh, n and then by rescaling, symplectic on some neighborhood, and, and then by rescaling, it's symplectic everywhere. So, yeah, so th this kind of little discovery here, but, but uh, again, I, I don't understand this weighted normal bundle well enough to, to make this really exciting, but, but there should be some, some good way of describing it, and I just haven't seen it yet. And yeah, so, so I, I think I should just stop here.